Tonight, we're going to learn what it's like to be the Queen's representative, what it's like to live a day in your life, although I know there is no such thing as a typical day in your life. You, your honor, are a lifelong learner. And there are many things, I think, that you have learned through this role. So we're looking forward to hearing more about that. So our first question, you must have really a deepened understanding of the crown and what it means to be the crown's representative. And there's constitutional duties, and they're very significant. What were some of the first things that you learned in this role, and how did you prepare? Well, first of all, I just want everybody here to know, and this is one thing that happens all the time, the name is Lieutenant Governor, and what happens is you go out, and people, especially depending on where you are, they say Lieutenant. But you all know Lieutenant is that is what's used in the states. So it's because we hear it so much, we think it's lieutenant. But of course, lieutenant is taken from the French. So remember, I tell that first of all to everybody, remember that it's lieutenant governor. So um, I wanted to really, I guess, get everybody to feel that there are three major parts to being a lieutenant governor. And the first one is constitutional. And that part is so important. I can't tell you how important it is. I have to give royal assent. And then we do, I mean, it's amazing the number of documents that I sign. I can't get over it myself. But I will tell you that you would only refuse to sign royal assent if it was illegal. And of a lot of you, I know, there's a few people here that we do a few things together at Government House. And a lot of you will know that at Government House, and there in 1937, there was one of the Lieutenant Governors, John Bowen, who said to the then Premier, Abraham, he said, I will not sign this. I will not sign this. This is absolutely unconstitutional. It goes against the rights of the people of Alberta. And so he said, I won't sign it. Now you have to understand, that no matter what, that's the big protection is. That's why there's checks and balances. So Lieutenant Governor has that final authority. If they don't sign it, it doesn't go through. The, the actual Premier could not do very much about that, except that because he was living in Government House, what do you think he decided to do? What would you think? How would you get rid of a tenant that you didn't like? What would you do? Think about it. First thing, we'll turn off the heat. Yes, and then we'll turn off the water. Absolutely. And in the meantime, he was sending little epistles. And if you all go, I want this to tell you, I want you all to go and visit Government House. It's so amazing. This beautiful historic building with all the most wonderful art in the world. So what happened is they had to move out. In the meantime, he was sending to the Governor General these coded messages, they were all coded. And you know, to this day, we're not sure what those codes are and what he did. So I'm doing a contest next year. Mm -hmm. I want to find out exactly what they say. But he was pretty frantic, but he had to move out. He literally had to move out. And that is why we are so fortunate in Canada that there is that check and balance. So a constitutional duties are the most important duties that any lieutenant governor can have. The other ones are wonderful too, and we'll talk about those, but the constitutional part is by far the most important. Your Honor, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about this contest as we talk over the next sure, year, I'm so sure. I think that could be good. But one of the constitutional... Where's my poor, where's my poor, poor Brian? You have to understand that, you know, I'm a very active lieutenant governor. I come up with contests all the time. And then, <laughs> <laughs> guess who has to enact them? My poor office, I have to tell you, that's in the ledge has to enact them all. So That is really good. <laughs> one of the duties of uh, constitutional duties of lieutenant governor is reading the speech from the throne. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you have had, ever had a chance to be there or to witness that. And I was very fortunate to hear that a couple of times when I was at the province. And, 
and to hear you read it was really a special, special experience. But what was that like for you, and especially the first time that you did that? How did, how did, how did you prepare, and what did it feel like? Well, when you read the speech from the throne, it is not your speech. It's the premier speech. So part of it is, it isn't easy sometimes, because you have to read exactly what's there. That's what you have to do. So it's one of those things, though, you have to read it with understanding. But I will tell you, it's kind of a funny feeling. Because you've got the one side that are smiling at you and nodding and looking like, yes, that's wonderful, Lieutenant Governor. And you've got the other side that's <laughs> scowling at you. <laughs> so it's very interesting. But I will tell you one thing. Helen Hunley was a wonderful Lieutenant Governor. She, one thing she did was have these purple robes made. And now I always wear the purple robes in memory of Helen Hunley, our first, yes, woman Lieutenant Governor. That's beautiful. That's so a I mean, nice part story. of it, I love it. Mm -hmm. I do, <laughs> but it's not the easiest thing to do, and that's what I'm saying because it's not your speech, and people have to understand that. I think that's an important distinction. I'm not sure everybody does understand, understand that, that, but we all we all certainly do now. The crown unites us as members of the Commonwealth, and it represents our shared understanding of democracy and human rights and the rule of law. Yep. Absolutely. It's a powerful concept to contemplate. And I wonder what that means, it means for you. Well, I think what's wonderful about the Crown, and I mean, for one thing, I have learned so much about the Commonwealth. This has been very, uh, which I call a real eye-opener for me, that there are these 53 Commonwealth countries that are united. Rwanda, who joined the Commonwealth in 2009, even though they had no historic, if you could imagine, connection to, to, the, to the crown of the queen. Because people want to be a part of the Commonwealth because it stands for mm -hmm. democracy and the freedoms, which is what they so much, I mean, they, they crave. And we know that there's countries, I will tell you one thing I've learned, I am not just an Albertan or a Canadian, I am a global citizen. And I feel that more and more every single day. And I wish that all of us would understand our world is small. I mean, I've got my granddaughter, she was in Paris when the bomb went off. We all have to understand that we, can, we don't know where any of our families or our best neighbors are ever going to end up. I feel very strongly that we are all global citizens. We, though, have to have understand a few things that are so precious to us in Canada. That right to vote, which is so, so important, that we have to exercise that right to vote. The wonderful thing is, of course, this democracy of allowing people to run for public office. I mean, that itself, I give a lot of credit that are willing to people that will run for public office. I absolutely think they're wonderful because it's not easy. It doesn't matter what party, because don't forget, I am nonpartisan. I have to be nonpartisan. It doesn't matter how, I have to tell you, my heart beats one way or the other, no. You have to be nonpartisan, and you have to do that and remember that every single day. So this is all part of it, is that we are so fortunate that we have, and I, I'm going to tell you one other thing. Yes, for you women that are smiling, we have, out of the 10 lieutenant governors in Canada, we have seven women now. Yes, we do. Seven women are lieutenant governors. And I will tell you, I am so very fortunate because I represent this amazing, amazing province of which I've grown to love dearly. And it's part of this that everywhere I go, I meet the most wonderful people. A lot of them that have come from elsewhere because they want to live in a province like Alberta. And I know that quite often we can be plagued with negativity. But for me, it's always looking above that, which is what we have to do, and really glorify and be grateful for even all the small things every day that come our way. I believe so strongly in that. I was brought up that way. My mother said, if you're not grateful for the small things, you'll never get the big things. And I really believe that's true. So while we are talking about the crown, 
I can't resist asking, and there may be a person or two in the audience who also <laughs> care to know, but have you ever met the Queen, and have you ever been to Buckingham Palace? Well, yes, of course, I will tell you. Fortunately, my husband has been an honorary colonel in the King's Own, and as a result, the Queen, believe it or not, was their commanders. He was already had gone over two and three times to meet her, which was wonderful. But for me, I think I could tell you that every lieutenant governor, of course, she's your boss, believe it or not. <laughs> that's who you, re you represent her. That's, people misunderstand. It's not the governor general, the queen. You represent the queen. So it's wonderful to meet her. But I had, I think, probably one of the best experiences any lieutenant governor could have ever had. I became involved in Princess Charities. That's Prince Charles's charities. Mm -hmm. I became involved with them before I became lieutenant governor. So I was fortunate that I had cared and learned about what Prince Charles was all about. I mean, no matter what, we do have to understand that Prince Charles will be king one day. So it was one of those wonderful things to be involved with, it, with the, his charities. So when I was able to go over, because they asked, when can you come over and be with the queen? When do you get the, a chance to really, have you got some time to spend a week over there? Which is the most wonderful thing? So I was fortunate because the first thing I did was I went to visit Prince Charles. He has, and he was absolutely wonderful. I want to tell you the best kept secret though. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to this, um, because he has the most beautiful, it's called High Grove, the most mm. beautiful, he's a horticulturalist, that's what he loves, loves doing that. He introduced me to this wonderful woman, and he said, let's all take pictures. I said, oh, are we allowed to take pictures? I was told, we shouldn't. oh yes, we're gonna take pictures. That wonderful lady is from Edmonton. His gardener, Prince Charles's gardener, who also has 14 people that work for her, is from Edmonton. And I'm very proud to tell you that fact. And she's a wonderful woman. And that was the first day. The next day, we actually were at Westminster Abbey. And Westminster Abbey was one of those wonderful events where they actually had Malala. They had speakers. It's in this beautiful, uh, this service. It's unbelievable. And afterwards, we were invited to a, a tea. And there was only, I didn't understand that there was only a few of us that were gonna be in certain sections. And they said, this is for you to go to the blue room. And I go, oh, in that blue room, there were three prime minister, past prime ministers. There was really 20 of us there. And they said, the queen and of course, her husband will be coming here soon. So they got us lined up and there we were lined up. She came in and you know, the first thing she said to me is, I'm so looking forward to spending time with you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like, how good is that? You think to yourself, I understand, she's so well prepared, but I call her 92 years young, because that's what she is. She's amazing. I said, yes, I'm looking forward to it too. And then he came along and he entered, and I said, I'm Lieutenant Governor from Alberta, and I shouldn't have done this. I said, Canada? He goes, well, of course I know where Alberta is. I've been there more than anybody else. And I said, oh, well, that is wonderful. I passed him off immediately to my husband. <laughs> but the next day, the next day, I will tell you, the picture that we took so long to decide we should take a, a painting over to her, I said to her the next day at Buckingham Palace, this is not for you. It's for your husband because I insulted him. She laughed and laughed, so I'll give it to him. <laughs> but that's what she's like. She's got a great sense of humor. So does he. And so it was one of those experiences that kept getting better. The next day, we were able to go. My husband uh, had a friend that was head of the rugby for Canada. We had these great tickets to Trickenham. We went to Trickenham, and there, two rows behind, was Prince Harry. Like, that was the first time I'd really got to know him. But his huge love of sport, as you know. And then, because of the Invictus Games, I represented Alberta in our Invictus Games in Toronto. So I will tell you, I've had the opportunity. Oh, and I will say a lot to do with my husband. My husband, for some reason, was in a position that we were able, when uh, Prince William came with Kate, we actually got to say goodbye to them. We were the ones, there was only four of us, and I still to this day, I'm not quite sure how that worked, but they were wonderful. And we, that was in 2011. So we had this, we were at the airplane saying goodbye to them, and you couldn't help but just love them. 
absolutely love them. So I've had a lot to do. And then, you know, Princess Anne was just here. You all know that. She was here because she represents the, um, this wonderful agriculture, we're all agricultural for the Commonwealth. She was here for four days. So a lot to deal with these wonderful royals who are wonderful. That's what they are. They're wonderful. Oh, it's so exciting to get that color commentary and behind the scenes. I'm thinking now about your ceremonial role. There are three big roles for the Lieutenant Governor. So just let me make sure. Do you all know the first one mm -hmm. is constitutional? constitutional. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to talk we're about moving to the next ceremonial. One. So ceremony, things like the Alberta Order of Excellence, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, um, the LG Alberta Arts Awards, things like that is what we're talking about. So I think it's helpful, helpful for us uh, to leave here tonight with a deepened understanding of that work. And I think in particular, um, the mindset and the services and the sacrifices of our men and women in uniform. Mm -hmm. And I know that that is powerful work and work that you respect mightily and that you have spent a lot of time um, concentrating on in your role as Lieutenant Governor. So I'm wondering, are Vice Regal reps, they have military and ceremonial aspects of what you do. What's it like? And what's it like to transition from civilian to that kind of work, to doing that kind of work? What, what was that like for you? Well, ceremonial is wonderful because so many times you're giving out these wonderful awards to volunteers. This is what makes, I'll tell you, Alberta tick. There's no doubt about it. So it's, it's that opportunity to really get to know, at first of all, the military. Because I will tell you, uh, my husband being an honorary colonel, I wasn't as involved in the military as I probably felt I should have been, but I totally immersed myself into it. I will tell you right now. I've been to the, I do a lot of things at the base. I've got involved with family resource centers that they have. Um, I've got to really understand, I've been to Bold Eagle, which is where, uh, that's in Wainwright, where they have this wonderful group of, I would tell you, 120 um, of the Indigenous people from the reserves come. I've gone every year to that. It's one of the most amazing things. So, and they do a lot of training, by the way, at Wainwright, you know. And then I've been to Suffield, which you know where our British shoulders come over to train. So there are so many wonderful things that we in Alberta do, I have to say mm -hmm. that. But I will tell you, I just got to love the military families because sometimes we forget. And of course, ceremonial, I just did Butter Dome. You know, we have 7,000 people come to the Butter Dome. I haven't missed one November the 11th ceremony. And I love it. I love everything about that Butter Dome, the whole ceremony. And I think they plant, it gets, I think, over 70 wreaths this year. But the children all, they have all these wonderful little, uh, not just the cadet corps, they have the little brownies. They have all of them, and they all march. And I love that. That's one of my favorite things to do. So there's so many things that were an eye-opener for me to become part of that ceremonial. And it's just absolutely wonderful to be part of it. Was it challenging as well? Because there's specific things that you need to learn, things like salutes and protocols and inspecting the troops that I would think have quite a few steps and systems involved in them. Right, but you learn. You ask for help and you ask how long, how long should I be talking to each of these while everybody's waiting? So you would know that. But just so for some of you, I realized there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you people. Just to first of all, how many people here have been involved in the military or have families that are involved in the military, right? Yes, yes. So I have such a respect. No stone left alone, I love that. I've been involved with them from the beginning, very, very beginning. Um, not, not their beginning, I would say, but really my beginning. And I've become a very, very good friend of Maureen Purvis who started that. This is an amazing woman who did it with all by herself, volunteers. Uh, it's just one of those wonderful stories that makes you want to cry when you think of now 8,000 students across Canada placing those poppies on those graves. That's a wonderful story. So not only that, as you say, but there's the many other things that you get involved in that are part of the military. But for me even, okay, so I asked you. So you know, in order of precedence, I wondered if you would like to know this. So in order of precedence, and it's to do with actually transportation, of how the RCMP is first because they were on the horseback, right? 
So in, when you think about the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, who do you think would be next? You're allowed to shout that out. Air. Sorry? Air. No, because they're last, because that's the last thing when you think of it that really was started. Even though, even though I'll tell you, I did learn all about that. On, on, I have to tell you, I watched documentaries. And during that First World War, I learned all about the air reconnaissance. But really, when you think of it, it was the ships next. So the horses, the ships, and then the tanks, and then the, and then the airplanes. <laughs> That's the order of precedence. It's just something interesting to know. Just to give us a bit of a sense, too, of the scope of your work, how many ceremonies do you go to a year? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Is it, is it every second or third day? Or it depends. Every... I mean, everything depends. You know, it is. I have to tell you that. You can actually look at that. And, you know, we've started now um, with our web page. You'll see all the events I go to. We sometimes don't get them all down. But I do go to a lot. And I, I love doing it. I've been blessed with good energy. And that's the most important thing, you know, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's all part of it. And so I'm very fortunate. So yes, I do a lot. Mm. Yes. Just coming back, one more question around. I want to talk about Vimy Ridge for a moment. And I don't know how many people saw on your way in that incredible Lego sculpt. I mean, it's a sculpture. It's an artwork, yeah. really, of oh. Vimy. It's absolutely astonishing. And have any of you had an opportunity to go and see it in person? There are some people in the audience who have. My, my husband and kids and I, we got to see it just a little over a year ago and just found it absolutely, it is so powerful. And last night as I was preparing for our conversation here today, um, I was looking at some videos and some award-winning artworks that deal and address, uh, and address Vimy. And I just, I wonder for you what it, what it feels like to be so connected to that work. It must be a powerful sort of soulful change and I don't think it would be a, a, a mega change for you because it's always something you've been interested in. It's very much a part of your values and principles but it must touch you more deeply somehow to look people in the eye and really get to know personal stories. But the most important thing for me is is teaching the young people. We did the spirit of Vimy. That's what we did, the spirit of Vimy Ridge. And we gave people, two winners, trips to go to Vimy. Two, one was from Calgary and the other is from Edmonton. Her, Rebecca is amazing that not only did she do a video, but she composed a song. Mm -hmm. So do you know, last, well, at the November the 11th week, three times we got her to perform. And she's so happy to do it. And she's such a, it's such a beautiful story. So the contest, I mean, this is where <laughs> staff <laughs> tear their hair out sometimes. These contests are very time consuming. I have to tell you that <laughs> for the staff. <laughs> and they are so, when you meet them, you feel so good. So we did this wonderful uh, Spirit of Peace um, this year. So we did the Spirit of Emmy. And this year we did the spirit of, of peace. And um, what's, what's really wonderful um, about that is that we, again, showcase those students. And we do it for all over Alberta. That's why it's wonderful. And um, we, we do a lot of things that we feel I have the, the capacity to do because I have great staff. I don't tell them that very often. Great staff. And so they implement. Um, so we've had some wonderful, I think, contests that have gone on, but I'm all about the young people, and you would be shocked at how amazingly dedicated they are mm -hmm. to something even far back as Vimy and then the, the, the hundreds, the armistice. We had a wonderful response from that as mm -hmm. well, the spirit of peace. I'm going to move now into the third role. Okay. Okay. So social, the third role is social. And along those lines, and it does correlate, I promise, you have a love of history. Yes, I do. So what are some of your favorite history stories that you have learned in this role? And we'll, we'll sort out as we go how that relates to the social part of your work. Probably for me, more than anything, I think, is doing anything with the young people has been the most enlightening thing because I was a teacher it's easy for me I love school at the ledge at least once a week I do school at the ledge 
these wonderful great, they're only allowed to have six at a time come into my office. So you can imagine how fortunate I am. I entertain at Government House, which I'm going to ask you a bit of a question in a minute about that. But I will tell you right now that I do a lot of the work from the ledge. I have a great office on the ledge. And that's where these wonderful students come. And we have a great talk. I have to say that. And even last night, I did do the opening for the Grey Cup. I did on this wonderful Jasper Avenue. This wonderful man said, please, Lieutenant Governor, this is my son. He's studying all about you. And that gives me the biggest thrill. Mm -hmm. He's, they're so wonderful, these students. I can't begin to tell you how wonderful. But from that, from that, I'll tell you one thing I'm a big believer in. I am a huge believer in the office of Lieutenant Governor. I had a dear friend called Normie Kwong who cared deeply about, I have to tell you, sports and parks. I, I go every year to those big conventions and I talk about Normie because he, he, he wanted to do something but he wasn't able to leave any kind of a legacy. Don Ethel was after me. He cared deeply about mental health. But it ended up being, if you don't have the, where I'm not a, a believer in asking government for anything. I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't do that. So for me, I decided, okay, what can we do? I met this amazing man. Well, I knew him beforehand, his name's Stan Milner. You know the, Mil the library's named after him. And I did, when I was doing The Spirit of Vimy, he said to me, you know what? You've gotta have a foundation because you've gotta carry on the work that you care about. We have a foundation called the History and Heroes Foundation. Let me tell you how wonderful the people of Edmonton are, because 90% of it has happened because of them. He said to me, Stan Miller, come for dinner. He said, you see that man beside you? He's your new chair. This man's name is Ralph Young. This is a man that cared about history and the heroes of Alberta like I did. And he said, I'll take that job on. I will be your chair. He put together the most wonderful group of people and I will tell you in, the, in one year, we've raised over three quarters of a million dollars, all from private. This is what's great about it is. So what's gonna be wonderful is we are giving money and this is where this whole thing is, we're able to do this. We have these wonderful, we, these wonderful universities and colleges that need help, that we're able to give some, scholar, we'll call bursaries to them. Mm -hmm. We were able to have, I'm a, because I'm a t past teacher, I will tell you right now, teachers are our most prized resource. So we have a wonderful, wonderful, we, we, we give away these awards to the graduating teacher. The graduating teacher that's made a difference that we know in history. And I can't tell you how great that is. And I have to tell you the best thing that happened at Concordia University, when they invited me over for me to present the award, I opened it up, it was a big, huge round table. And I said, let's all talk about this. Let's talk about the people that meant something to us as teachers. And do you know at the end, the one that I gave the award to, his wife said to me, you know what, I feel I can say this to everybody here. My husband is autistic and he's a teacher. Now you all know there's different levels of autism, but this was wonderful that he in fact was able to go and this, do this wonderful presentation, but go out and be a teacher and be able to be such outstanding. And he writes so beautifully. And it was such a good feeling to know that we have to stop labeling people of any kind. Stop making judgments because everybody has some huge gift within them. But we do have to stop labeling. And I just can't tell you what a thrill that was for me. I have to be honest, one of the biggest thrills was having her say, I feel comfortable to be able to say that. That's what mm. happened. So I think we should ask some of these we people should. if there's some things. Yes. I just want to ask you something. How many of you people, because you talked about, we talked about the Queen. How many of you people carry a picture of the Queen in your wallet? Oh, thank you. How <laughs> come you do? Because? That's exactly right. <laughs> Art, there you are. That's very good. Absolutely. My $20 bill. That seems to be what I spend quite a bit of, 20s. <laughs> There's that wonderful picture of the queen and on our coins, right, too, on the gloony, yep, the nickel, everything else, okay. Phenomenal, yes, and we have time for questions from the audience. 
Hi. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for doing this presentation. I'm so excited for all the other ones that the Legislative Assembly is going to put on. I've been wanting to, them to do this for years because oh, I'm an import from another province. So my question to you is, as a person who is a history buff, um, what are your thoughts around Black History Month and Amber Valley and the great rich history we have of diversity in this province and how much more we can do in order to encourage folks around this province to feel not only just like they belong, but that they are part of that history. Um, because I think that's such a valuable thing that the Lieutenant Governor and the Crown and folks can do from a nonpartisan perspective. I, I think that's a wonderful question. I have to tell you that. Um, absolutely. I do know all about History Month, Black History Month. And actually, yes, I think I should do a lot more about that. And so you inspired me to do something for the for office. It's okay, I've got an office in Calgary too. We'll just save it for the office in Calgary to take that one on. But absolutely should be done. You know the one wonderful thing about the Indigenous now, and you would all know that, that we are very much aware. And I, I will tell you what I loved on, I, just, I started the week on Monday night with the Red Cross Awards. And I sat with an amazing elder. Um, he is uh, one of these amazing elders that is so full of love and so full of, of energy and wanting to teach me. And so he took the feather and it took him at least 15 minutes, but I loved it, throw over dinner, to teach me about the feather. Every day I learn something new and that's one of my goals is to write down five things I've learned each week with the Indigenous. But the black, I absolutely couldn't agree more because that's a wonderful story. That's a very good story. And I'll put that down and I will make sure that we start working on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. I like that. Any more questions? Um, hello, Your Honor. Um, so do you see your role as Lieutenant Governor changing in the near future? And do you think it should change? Or do you believe that it should be um, cast in amber as it is? You know, I mean, definitely I don't think it should change because I think it's so precious. I, this is what I'm talking about, being part of the Commonwealth. And the one thing I'm very proud of is that um, because of my love for the Queen and because of my understanding of, of the Commonwealth, um, I was able to do, they came to me from London and they said, you're the only country that doesn't have a Commonwealth walkway. Did you know that? like Australia, New Zealand, because we get compared to other countries. And I said, you know, we'll do something about that. And so we had the first Commonwealth walkway in Canada in Banff. But I'm going to tell you another secret. It's really important, these Commonwealth walkways, because it's all about not just history of, of what's happened with, with royalty, but it's also it's about getting people out to be physically active. So that is the most important thing for me, is to get people. I think it's terrible for young people. I'd like to know how many of you, are, and I love the pages. I love that program. I think you're wonderful. But I have to ask you about how important it is, and if your friends know how physically active you have to be. There's alarming statistics, and it's because these little children, you know from the time they're three years old, that they've got in front of them. And so they stop even going out to play hide and go seek and doing all these things. And it really worries me. So, but I would tell you, our constitution, based on democracy and what's going on in the Commonwealth, we are very, very fortunate. I will tell you the one thing though, no matter what, no matter what, there will be a change and it will not be singing, God save the queen. I love to say God save the king. And I am not looking forward to that day, but I know it will be, you know, in the future. I just want to say it's such an honor to hear you speak tonight. Um, but you've had so many amazing experiences in your life, not just in this role, but previous. So what advice would you give someone for them to have a meaningful life? You know, a meaningful life is all about your values. You know, this is one thing that I have loved to learn Values is not, you know how they have all the demographics, they talk about millennium, all these, no. The values, who you do work with and who anybody you have any kind of time you spend with, make sure they have the same values, make sure they care the same thing that you care about because values are the most important thing. You know, they talk about, it's one of those funny things, they don't teach it much about values clarification, but there's kind of 48 known values 
And you know, for me, for me, I was fortunate. I was brought up, it was nothing to do what the person was like on the outside. It only mattered what they were like inside. I was brought up with that value. And so it's one of those things that it all depends on every value that you have, is that's what's the most important thing of all. Find people. It doesn't matter about age or anything. It's the, look at the 48 values and then find out. They can change a bit. That's okay to change. It is. It's okay, those changes. As long, because I used to teach values clarification. And they would say to me, does that person, especially if you were doing it for a company that was about wealth management, if they don't care about money, there's no, they shouldn't be in that job. They really shouldn't be. So it's one of those things they can change, but it's important to understand about values and look them up and then make sure that no matter what, and this is what I also think is important, whoever you choose to spend the time with late in life for a long time, just the most important thing is those values match up. <laughs> so, I, and all I can say to you is, I will tell you something very, you know, I'm not a super skirt, I never have been. My husband will tell you that. I became an international food judge and I can't cook. Seriously, I became the mother of the year and my children said, make your bed mother, we've got in company. So I want you to know you don't have to be perfect at things, but you have to have those values. And you, I'm a big believer in not just high IQs, that's okay, people always wanna talk about these IQs. The emotional IQ is really, really important that goes with it. Some people can have that very high IQ, but if you don't have that emotional, which means that you're unselfish, you think of the other person. And the other part to that is a moral IQ, doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time. Mm -hmm. Okay, got one there. Hi, uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, uh, for speaking, and thank you, Carolyn, for the wonderful questions. I will keep my question nice and short, and uh, what's your favorite place in Alberta and why? <laughs> you know, I want to you know something. Let me tell you about the end of the, those contests I did. I also took on agriculture because I felt it was very important to our province, so I did this wonderful agricultural contest. And we had poetry written from grade four, five, and six, and from seven, eight, nine essays. And then we actually did a program, a virtual reality program, called, it was called GROWS for the older ones. The ones that were from grade four to grade nine, we took them if they were from Red Deer up north, they got, and they came from all over, they got to go with me on that Alberta Prairie, the train out of Statler, we took them on a train. That was really fun and wonderful and what a great learning for me. If you were from Red Deer South, you got to go on the Aspen Crossing train. And I mean, both these trains are run by these amazing men. They are entrepreneurs that do this, that wanted to give something back. So I would tell you, we ended up on the Aspen Crossing train. And I mean, it'll, I will tell you it's because it is Southern, it would be a place you've never heard of. But let me tell you one thing. The Aspen Crossing train, and they do this Polar Express for Christmas. Do you know it's ranked number two in North America? How many people? So for me, I have to tell you, I was enlightened. It wasn't, it's not just I'll never tell you my favorite spot because I love them all. I'm sorry. But did I ever love going to Aspen Crossing because I learned so much? about what's going on there and the wonderful entrepreneurship that goes there. It, they, the wonderful man that did it, he's got these beautiful places to stay in. They're trains that he's taken and done up and you can rent them. And I just loved it. So everywhere I go, I want you to know I love it. I love going over, I have to tell you, uh, I love going to Edson, then on to Hinton, then to Jasper. That's a big, that's one of my favorite drives, I have to tell you. I have so many favorite things, but no, I don't have a favorite. I really don't. And I'm also smart, but I'd never tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody here. And thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for coming and speaking to us today. It's an incredible honor and privilege to hear your stories and your perspectives. Like, I'm really thrilled. It's a lot of, it's really interesting to hear what, like, your life learning and everything you've learned in your job. And like, it's an incredible honor. And like, thank you so much for doing this. That's wonderful. Tell me about you. Where, what, what about you? Where, tell me where you come from to be a, what place in Alberta are you from? I'm from Edmonton. Okay. Um, are you almost all from Edmonton, you pages? Really? Most Those of us poor, are, yeah. Poor other people from Red Deer and Calgary, they don't get to be a page? <laughs> okay, go ahead. 
But my, it's a very, I have a very simple question. Like, I think it's a very important question. Um, what is the role of Lieutenant Governor of Alberta in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with Indigenous Canadians? But this is why we do so much now, I have to tell you. They, of course, because I have become friends, I'll tell you one thing that is really important to me, that they are very accepting of, of the Lieutenant Governor. They really want to involve me in everything now. And I'm going to tell you, Maskechi, I don't know, it used to be called Habima. Do you know I am so involved with what's going on with them? And I can tell you that you, you talk about people that I have learned a great deal with. I, not only have I met brilliant, brilliant people, I spend a lot of time down there, but I believe truly that this reconciliation is going to get better and better. Because the more people talk, and by the way, the one thing I've learned is you always talk in a circle. That's the one thing, gather around. I, I've learned so much from them, but I feel that we have a lot more to learn. I have to say that. As my role is simply being there to support because these Lieutenant Governor Awards we're doing, we're doing them for the first time in a community like that. They've always been done in the bigger centers. We're doing it there. So I feel I have an important role to be there. It's being there and showing them I care. That's the important thing. And you can't fake that, you know that. I, I will tell you at the Olympics in 1988, my biggest thing was I asked, they asked me to teach all about these um, cultural diversities. And I said everybody in there, if you don't believe in brotherhood of man, you shouldn't be in this room and I can't teach you anything. So I'm a big believer in making sure we learn, understand their position, and let's move on with this because there's lots of great things that can happen with that reconciliation. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. That was a tremendous question, and all of your questions were extraordinary. Once again, thank you, everyone, for coming here tonight. We really appreciate your time, and thank you, Your Honor. This was exciting, and I enjoyed it immensely, and I learned so much from you. So we really As I learned from you, Carolyn, you know you. that. Thank you, Absolutely. everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.